the edges and how to represent those. So do you see how a node has an edge field called, well, it has a field called back edge that is of type edge. So in the edge class, it would make sense to have a to and a from, right? If we define the nodes, if we define this class before we define the edges, then you're gonna have to stick a class in front of that word edge. Otherwise, when it sees edge, it won't know what you're talking about because we haven't defined anything called edge yet. If you have the edge class listed first before the nodes, that's going to be flip-flopped. So let's imagine that we, we will write the node class later down on in the code and the edge class is at the top just so you can see what that looks like. So I don't think you've had a lab yet where your class is um, kind of refer to each other. You might have done it on your own, but I haven't suggested that before. So this is what it would look like. If you were writing the edge class first in your code, then you would have to just write class node star two and class node star from. And so that way the compiler knows okay, there's some class called node that you define later for me. I just haven't seen it yet. And there's no way to get around this because in the class node, if you wrote that first, you have edges in the node class. So you have to do it with one or the other. So this is assuming edges written first. And then you'll also have a reverse edge. So let's talk about the edges now. So we have the to and the from, which should make sense. I'm just taking ENG, ENG maps to a G and the E. I'm going to make an edge that goes here and here. With network flow, you're going to have to be dealing with back flow in residual stuff. And it's kind of confusing in this lab because all of the weights are the same. So it's hard to imagine what's really going on. In some ways, it's, it makes the lab easier that all the weights are the same. In some ways, it makes it harder because it's hard to visualize the flow and what's happening. And you tend to think of this as an on and off edge instead of it having flow. So while you're reading through the notes, I would set it up this way so you could use it in the future your code, um, just pull it out and use it for a network flow problem that does have weight. And also, it's a little easier to follow his notes that do deal with having weights on the edges and flow. So when you're going through this, just imagine that the weight is one and there's a flow of one for every edge as opposed to like this on-off deal that you might be inclined to think about. So again, we're going from ENG to G and E. And this edge, I'm going to only deal with the G. Let's just forget about this right now. Fix that in a second. So I'm going to call this E1. When I see that there's a connection here, I'm looking at this node versus this node, and I see in the letters vector that they share G having been turned on. So that's how I would know that these should have a connection. When I go through both of these letters vectors and compare them, they both have the G turned on. So I know I should make an edge. So I'm going to make an edge here. And when I make an edge going forward from the source to the dice nodes, from the dice nodes to the word nodes, from the word nodes to the sink, I'm going to set the original equal to 1 and the residual equal to 0. So this is starting out, setting up, 
E1 will be set to this from the get-go. But I'm also going to make a reverse edge. So one thing that people get really confused about is the difference between what I'm calling a reverse edge, you could call it back flow, and the back edge. So the edge has a reverse edge. It's the exact same edge going in the opposite direction. Nodes have a back edge, which is different. A node's back edge tells me how did I get to this node? What path did I take to get to this node? This edge took me there. That's what a back edge is. A reverse edge is only part of the edge class. And if I take E1, this I'm going to call E1R for E1 reverse. I'm going to make new calls for both E1 and E1R when I see that the G's match up in their letters vector. So this is going to be a new edge. And this is going to be a new edge. I'll fill in all of their information. And E1's reverse field should equal E1R. And E1R's reverse field should equal E1. So these guys point to each other using the reverse field. Does that make sense? Back edge is completely different and I'll talk about it in a little bit. So again, starting out and setting up, E1 is going to have an original of 1 and a residual of 0. E1R is going to be the opposite, original of 1 and residual. Sorry, original of 0, residual of 1. What I was writing on for. So I'm going to go through and set up my entire graph this way using those starting values um, again for the E1 that's any edge that's going forward in the graph I'm going to say going from the source to the dice nodes or from the dice nodes to the word nodes or from the word nodes to the sink. So we're going to set up our edges that way. And then lastly let's have the graph class. Is everyone good with the enum? Because it's kind of taking up a lot of space. Do you want to understand that? We just use this for the notes. So, back class. subtract things from these classes. These are just suggestions. I think this would help in referring to Dr. Plank's stuff. So. And also because the weights are one, you can get around with not using some of these um, fields, but it would be very hard to take your code and use it later in life. Um, so like five years down the road when you have a network flow problem that actually does have weights, you might be hitting yourself so, grab class, going back to that. Like always, we'll have a vector that contains all of our nodes. We'll have our breadth for search. I had a function called can I spell, which calls breadth for search, and can I spell returns to you whether you can spell that word or not. A zero if you can, a one if you can. So I'll go over that in a second. that I use to spell that word so I can print it out easy. Er, so this is used to And then Dr. Plank mentioned 
mentions this in the write-up briefly. It's called delete half graph. And Ant Min knows. He doesn't actually name it delete half graph. This is by doing in min nodes. But this helps you out with not creating a bunch of graphs. So I was talking about before, if you figured out if you can spell rage or not, what delete half graph should do is after you've printed out the way to spell rage, because in this case we can't spell it, I'm going to call delete half graph and it will erase all of these edges, the edges between the dice nodes and the word nodes. It's going to delete all of these edges, the edges between the word nodes and the sink. And then it's going to delete these and delete these which your node type makes really easy. You just go through your nodes and say, okay, if sync delete, if word node delete, and resize, after you've deleted all of that, you resize nodes to min nodes. So min nodes you set up at the very beginning and min nodes in this case is equal to five. I made min nodes mean the number of nodes when I add together the source plus all of my dice nodes. So in a way I called it the minimum number of nodes for my graph and that I'll always have these nodes in whatever graph I make, but sometimes my words are gonna be shorter, sometimes they're gonna be longer, and then I'll just throw on the sink at the end. Obviously, you could figure out a way for delete half graph to keep the sync in there if you wanted to because you're going to make a sync every time but I thought it was easy just to use the resize get rid of it and just throw it on when I recreate the graph rather than try to deal with keeping just that single node every time it didn't seem worth the time to figure out so that's what delete half graph is for and mid nodes so again delete this Delete half graph, deletes the word nodes, the sink, and all edges, both forward and reverse, except the That's what my delete half graph did. And that helped save a lot of time running the grade scripts. Dr. Point mentions doing something like this. Um, he mentions something like this down here, I think, in his examples. I don't know exactly where in the write up. Uh, but he mentioned something like that. He also mentions um, what I call letters right here. He says that is inefficient as I could instead have a 256 element array for each die, which has one for each letter set in the die. I just use 26 um, instead of 256. You can use bit shifting if you want, you can do all sorts of things. Um, So we've gone over delete half graph, min node is used in delete half graph, and min nodes again is equal to number of nodes when adding source. Now we're getting to the meat of the problem. All of this setting up takes a lot of code, 